I love being a Christian. I love knowing that God, in all His great love, kindness, and mercy, has promised a place for His children to be for all eternity. I live with that confidence, don't you? As a Christian, I live for the confidence that I can be with God for an eternity. That God is so faithful. And as we've read many times in the Scriptures about God's faithfulness, as we've seen God's faithfulness throughout all of the Scriptures, we know that God always keeps His promise. And we know that one day we can hear those words, enter in thou good and faithful servant. As we await for that day, as we live on this earth, yes, we have confidence. Yes, we have hope. Yes, we trust in God. But we do know that life gets in the way, doesn't it? We know that the issues of life can cause us to lose sight, focus, and direction. And we know what that cause typically is in the human condition that we are, and that is fear. We're going to talk about fear being natural here in just a moment. A lot of times that fear comes from adversity. It comes from problems that happen in life. The adversity causes the issue. The issue becomes big. Our hearts become troubled. Our minds become confused, distorted, and, 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 and clouded with many other thoughts. And our fears tend to take over, don't they? But as a child of God, God teaches us how to overcome fear. God teaches us how to deal with adversity in our lives. And so let's look at our text as we begin this evening in Ezra chapter 4, and verse 4. We see a time here in which the people of God, they have been taken away captive for 70 years. They've been taken away from their homeland. They've been taken away from the place in which God had given them. The place flowing with milk and honey. And now Benjamin and Judah are coming back. They're coming back and they begin to build the temple of God. They lay the foundations of the temple. As they rejoiced in laying that and doing that work, we see that there are some people that were very happy and rejoiced of Israel. And some wept bitterly. How many people have talked about why some rejoiced and some wept? Some could have wept because now they're able to be at the place where God has promised them again. Maybe they wept because this temple wasn't as glorious as the first temple. Whatever it is, we know that the people of God here, as they're building the temple, are going to be faced with something that they didn't see coming. See, they were commissioned by the king of Assyria to go and build the temple. They were commissioned by him to go build the temple. And when we talk about them building the temple... We know the commission is coming from a man, but we know God. We know He wants His people to always be working, steadfast as Christians are taught. Immovable, always abounding, right? In the work of God. And yet troubled times can come. In Ezra chapter 4 and verse 4, we see the people of the land. The people of the land at this moment are people that were taken from the Gentile nations and brought forth into the Sumerian region and possessed the land of the children of Israel now. The people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah and they troubled them in building. Hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. We see here that the time of the people 
of Israel and building the temple are now being discouraged by the people who aren't supposed to be in the land in the first place. Let's talk about these origins of fear. Why are the people fearing at this moment? Why are they becoming discouraged? First and foremost, as I just mentioned, they are dealing with people that are not Israelites. Go back to chapter 3. Look with me at verse 3. It says, Fear came upon them because of the people of those countries. They set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening burnt offerings. The people of God were doing the work, but as they were doing the work, what was happening? You see, fear was building up inside of them. They were fearing what was all around them. Now, I do remember that when Joshua went into the land and led the people of Israel across the Jordan River, they were told to dispossess the people of the land. To take them out of the land. This land is yours. Given to them by God. They were told to dispossess the people from the land. And yes, they started off well. They obeyed God and the walls of Jericho fell down. But as they continued on, they made covenants with the people of the land. In which God said, do not do. They were given specific commands of what not to do because if they made covenants with those people of the land, if they intermarried with those people of the land, they would turn the hearts of the people of God from Him. God gave them a warning. And here as the people of God have been taken from their land. Oh, but don't forget, why were they taken from the land in the first place? Because they disobeyed God. They decided to go after the false gods of the people of the land. They decided to exchange the true worship of God for the worship of Baal and other foreign gods. And so the people here of Ezra's time, they are looking at the inhabitants of their land, and as they're doing the work, they're being troubled. They're being discouraged. And all this is happening because of the diversity that came upon them. Now consider this. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 4. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to Him since the days of Asherodon, the king of Assyria, who brought us... Here, you can read about this back in 2 Kings chapter 17. And you can see the king bringing those people into the land, and, and yet they weren't serving God. They were serving their false gods. And this is a time in which they had some adversity that came directly from God, and He sent lions upon them. It created havoc in the land for them. So they thought in 2 Kings 17 that well, let's go get a priest from the children of Israel and we'll bring that priest back here. He'll teach us all about this God that the Israelites worship and therefore we'll be in good standing with Him and, and these, these lions will go away. And Yet they did begin to serve God. They did trust in God. They did believe in God. But they did not give up their false gods. They intermingled this worship with God, the Almighty, and idols. And yet what we see here, that these inhabitants that brought this adversity to the, to the people of Israel, so wait, 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 we also serve God. We want to build with you. We want to do the work with you. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers, verse 3, house of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. The foreigners did not like this answer, did they? They were not happy hearing that they were not able to join in the work. I know there's many times as the church today that there are people who claim to be Christians, and yet they follow after a man's doctrine. They follow after their own ideas and their own whims. 
And they come to us as the church and they want to intermingle and say, well, we, we, we still worship the same God. You may think you're worshiping the same God. But our worship needs to be in spirit. The right place with us. Inside of us. But not just in spirit, but also in truth. Our worship needs to be in truth. It has to be the truth of God. The truth of God being where He is worshipped, not in these temples made with hands. He is worshipped in us. Because church, who are we? We are the temple of God. The adversity comes to the children of Israel. And they, as we just read in verses 4 and 5, they began to discourage them. And even to this extent, verse 5, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Oh, they didn't just do that. They also petitioned the king. They said to the king, O king, let it be known in verse 12, if you're following along in Ezra chapter 4, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. They then said in verse 13, let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom and the king's treasury will be diminished. How do you get on the side, the good side of a politician? Let them know that if this happens, everything that you hold dear, the power that you have, the money that comes in to pay the taxes and to pay what your lifestyle is like is going to go away. Church, does that not still happen across the world today? Think about just our country alone. I know there's a difference between what people believe in the country, but I'm not talking about the, the, the beliefs and the separation. I'm just talking about every time an election comes up, what are all the commercials like? that you see on your TV. If so-and-so gets into office, doom and gloom. If the other person gets into office, doom and gloom. They're not petitioning a king in this case. They're petitioning us. Don't vote for this person because these bad things are going to happen. This is what's happening at this time with these discouragers of Israel. They're going to the king and saying everything is going to be lost if you allow this city to be rebuilt. In a way, they were correct. Because God's people are strong. Because God is on their side. They don't need the fortified walls, the chariots, the manpower. They don't need the armies. Because God's army will always succeed with God. God's people will always succeed with Him. But what we see here, the origin of the fear that came to Israel, not just because of the foreigners saying, we want to build with you, and they were not happy because they said no to them, not just because of the adversity that came, but also the end result is that now that they have the foreigners, the ear of the king, and now that the king has listened to them and said, I am going to side with you, they then come to them with force and might. Verse 23, Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews by force of arms and made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. God's people stopped. They stopped because they feared the foreigners. They stopped because of the adversity that came. And they stopped because they thought that these people were mightier than they. They stopped working. That was their origins of fear. But let's think about this fear for a moment. Remember at the beginning of the lesson how glad we are when we talk about our Christian walk, our Christian faith, who we are in Christ and the hope that we have? We also have to recognize that we are just like the children of Israel in that human condition of fear. Fear is a natural emotion. If it wasn't a natural emotion for us to have, God wouldn't have dealt with it in the Scriptures. That is... Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6, we see Moses at this moment as he's given instructions to Israel and that at this time Joshua would be bringing them into the land of 
Israel and not Moses. Moses has not hollowed the name of God. He decided to strike the rock in his anger when God said, speak to it and let the water flow out. But Moses was angry with the people and he lost that ability to go into the land of Canaan. So Joshua is going to lead them in. And as Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 31, read with me please. Deuteronomy 31, beginning at verse 4. The Lord will do to them as He did to Sihon and Og and the kings of the Amorites in their land when He destroyed them. But the Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which you have commanded, which I have commanded you. What is the Lord going to do? He's going to be with His people. He's going to help His people even though they feared everything that the other side of the river had to hold. And that was the Gentile nations. They feared them. So what's the hope that God gives to them to overcome their fear? Verse 6, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. If fear wasn't natural, God wouldn't have dealt with this. He would have just said to His people, what are, you, what are you fearing for? That's not the way you should be as My people. No, He actually helps them overcome the fear by saying, do not fear. Why? Because I am with you. I go before you. I love that phrase that we read about God going before them. It says He sent the hornet before them. Can you imagine what it would be like to have God going before you and the people of the land of Canaan were already fearful of you with no battle array, with no mighty chariots, with no armor. These are shepherds coming out of Egypt. And yet they already fear you. Why? Because God is before you. Now think about Joshua 1 and verse 9. As Joshua takes the lead and brings them over to the land of Canaan, you know these verses. Songs have been written. Bible lessons have been, have been, have been given. Sermons have been preached on these very verses time and time again. Have I not commanded you? What's God saying? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. God knows that fear is natural for us. He created us. He made us. He made us with fear. The ability to fear. Think about Psalm 94 and verse 19. and We've addressed, as, as Brother Kevin did, the Psalms many times in the last lesson. and We look at how the psalmist was able to overcome his fears by trusting in God. I want you to think about this word that is mentioned by the psalmist in Psalm 94. As we know that he went through many struggles, sometimes those struggles were because of his own hand, and sometimes those struggles come because, because, came because of the enemies that he had. But Psalm 94, please look at verse 19 with me. The psalmist says, In the multitude of my anxieties, that's from the New King James, in the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. God knows we're going to be anxious as we are taught in Philippians 4 and verse 6 as a Christian to be anxious for nothing. Do not worry about anything. That's tough, isn't it? Have you ever been able to live your life without any worry whatsoever? I think there was one time that we can all probably as children of God say there was a moment when we didn't worry for that moment. And that was when we came out of that watery grave of baptism. There's only one thought on my mind when I was baptized. My sins have been washed away. But as we go through this life and we start walking it again, we start realizing that fear didn't go away just because I became a Christian. But fear can be controlled because I'm a child of God. Fear can be put in its place because I know who I am and my anxieties can go away. Think about today how many pills are made for anxiety. I'm not saying that there aren't people that have chemical imbalances and difficulties that they need help with through medication. But I want you to think about the anxieties that exist in many people. The anxiety is not because of a chemical imbalance, because of life issues. 
because of things that have happened in their life either by their hand or by the hands of another. And yet if we put our trust in God, as the psalmist says, He will delight, or pardon me, He will comfort and delight our souls. But we have to trust in Him. I want you to think about this natural emotion with our Lord and Savior. As Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, you remember what He said to His disciples? He said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death, stay here and watch. If you don't think that fear is a natural emotion, then you disagree with what Jesus was going through when He was preparing Himself to go to the cross. He went a little further. He fell on the ground. Now notice He's doing the same thing that the psalmist said, delighting in the Lord. That is, He's trusting in Him and going to Him as He prayed. If it were possible that the hour might pass from Him. Why is He asking for that? He knows His purpose, His mission. He knows why He came to this earth. But yet, in this anxious moments that Jesus is having, He's asking the Lord, let it go away from Me. But you know those wonderful words of trust in God, His Father, when He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for You. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Fear is a natural emotion. Fear is a natural emotion that affects us all. And yet when we talk about fear, a lot of times that fear comes from adversity in our lives. Let's go back to Ezra chapter 4. And let's recall again the origins of the adversity. The origins of diversity, a fear I mentioned a moment ago, was the foreigners of the people. But yet, the origin of the adversity is coming from the desires of the people of the foreign nations. They desire to work hand in hand with the people of God. And since they did not receive the answer they wanted, they wanted to do it to do so hand in hand. They wanted the answer yes, and we can work together, but yet their desire was squashed. By the answer, no. Now, if you're a human, have you ever been told no when you didn't want to be told no? <laughs> How do you feel? You could become angry. And these inhabitants of Israel, they became angry. They took their anger to the king. Just like as I believe this now is the third time that Genesis 37 is being referenced today but yet it fits perfect and in line with the origins of adversity. That is, why did the things that happened to Joseph happen? Because of the jealousy of his brothers. They were jealous of who Joseph was to his father. They were jealous of what Joseph had said about what his brothers and his mother and his father would do. And so adversity came to Joseph. As Brother Kevin mentioned a moment ago, he found himself in a pit. What am I going to do now? I didn't ask for this to happen. Yet because of someone else's jealousy, here I am in this moment. Think about pride. Can pride cause adversity in your life because of someone else's pride? In this case, Miriam and Aaron. Hasn't God also spoken to us in Numbers chapter 12? Not only to Moses, but also to us. Can you imagine that conversation that happened there in Numbers chapter 12 while they were in the tent? To the point that then God had to say, come out of the tent. I don't know what was being said. I'm not going to speculate on the conversation beyond what's written for us there in Numbers 12. But yet, Miriam and Aaron were upset. They made the accusations against Moses. Oh, you've married the Cushite woman. You've married a Gentile woman. You've married somebody that, 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 that's not according to what God has given us and instructed us to be a part of in our families and the relationships. They brought these accusations to him. Their pride got in the way and caused adversity for Moses. We know the outcome of what has happened, though, don't we? God was with Moses. Moses didn't have to say a thing. God intervened. Again, God is the comforter. And yet, Numbers 13, what about this origin of adversity? Fear. You say, wait a second, I thought we were talking about fear and adversity. But yet, an origin of adversity comes from fear itself. Consider the spies in Numbers 13. 
they were told to spy out the land, but because they feared the people of the land of Canaan, we were like grasshoppers in their eyes, they said. We are never able to overcome their mighty fortresses. They feared those people. And we know Caleb, as, as is his name, that barking dog, he cries out to the people of Israel, we can take them and we need to take them right now. But the people of Israel, they feared. They feared. And brought that adversity to Joshua, to Caleb, and to Moses. Now we've got to deal with this. What's the next thing we're going to deal with? Have you ever thought about that as a Christian? What's the next thing that I'm going to deal with? I just overcame this adversity. We just got through this moment. Now I've got to deal with another adversity. Christians, it happens to us all. And yet we're told to continue to find comfort in the Lord. Just as the Lord Himself, He went to the cross in Matthew 27, verse 8, and was crucified because the people envied Him. They envied Him. Much like what happened in Genesis 37 with Joseph, they were jealous of Him. Jesus was getting the attention. Jesus was speaking the Word of God. They didn't like that it was opposite of what they were teaching and what they were practicing. Oh, they loved the commandments of men. Oh, they loved their doctrines of men. Oh, they loved the things that they were doing that God had not commanded them. And yet Jesus came with the Word of God and spoke it to Him plainly. Spoke it to them clearly. And they crucified Him for it. Out of envy. Origins. Of adversity. Now, as we look at those internal origins, that is, desires of an individual, jealousies that happen in the heart, the pride that can exist, let's now look at this fear and adversity that can come from sources. That is, in this case, generally from men. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And let's please look at verses 21 and 28. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus Christ is speaking clearly to them about who He is and what He has brought. A sword. A sword. The Word of God is the sword that we, Ephesians chapter 6, are to take. Right, Christians? Take the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. You know, I made a statement a couple, a couple weeks ago that my son brought to my attention. And sometimes when you preach, and preachers, I know you're out there, that you say something you didn't mean to say or plan to say what I mean. You don't understand what I'm talking about? You didn't plan to say that. And I said this, and afterward my son said, hey, you said this, and it hit me. That is, many times we want, to, we want to wear the armor of God, but we don't want to wield the sword. We want to wear the breastplate of righteousness. Oh, we want to do good things, but we don't want to teach people the truth. We want to hide behind the, the, uh, the, the shield of faith, but we don't want to wield the sword of the Spirit. You see, there are a lot of people who claim Christianity that love doing good things. They love having faith, but they don't practice the truth from the Word of God. Jesus said He came to bring a sword. He didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And that sword would divide. That's what a sword does. It cuts things in two. It separates them, doesn't it? And so He's teaching His disciples very early before He departs from this world and becomes the King of His kingdom and reigns forever at the right hand of God, what does He teach them in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 21? He says, Now brother will deliver a brother to death. You realize that there are still Christians today in this world that are being betrayed by their own brethren. A father, his child, a ch and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Will men cause you to fear? Hey, your, your families that you have to turn your back on who decide that they don't want to practice what is true and cause all kinds of problems for you and your family and you have to say, I can't be around that anymore. I can't live like that. I can't have you causing issues with my family. I'm trying to direct my children to heaven. And I don't want them to be misdirected by my own family. And yet in verse 28, Jesus says, don't fear. Don't fear. Even if your family wants to get rid of you, don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
fear and adversity come from men. And just as the apostles dealt with in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, oh, the famous verse, the phrase that many pre people have, have quoted often, we ought to obey God rather than men. But what were those men doing to the apostles? They were causing them, they were trying to cause them to fear. Fear them. They were causing all kinds of adversity, throwing them in prison, bringing them before the councils. Let's see how they can hold up to this. Let's see what they're going to say about that. You know, the fear and adversity came, and yet, remember what Peter and John did when they were beaten? They rejoiced that they were able to suffer for the cause of Christ. We're out to obey God than men. And I think about Hebrews 13 and verse 6. The Hebrew writer clearly, at the end of this, this book, says that we should be bold. Bold to be able to say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Do you really trust that Jesus said they can kill your body, but they cannot take your soul? Do you trust that? 1 Peter chapter 3, and verses, uh, uh, verses 13 and 14. Peter says to these persecuted Christians, Who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The children of Israel could have learned a lot from what Peter has just said. But Christians, you see, we are here at this moment right now learning the same thing that Peter taught to these first century Christians. Don't be afraid of threats. Don't be afraid of trouble that comes. Stop fearing the adversity from men. How about from governments? Go back to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 18 this time. We see that Jesus says to His disciples in verse 18, You will be brought before governors and kings for My sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. You'll be brought before kings and governors for My sake. Verse 26, He says, Therefore don't fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and nothing hidden that will not be known. Now, take that and put that with what Moses did in Hebrews 11 verse 27. Moses forsook Egypt not fearing the king. Moses forsook Egypt not... What was the king going to do to him? What could the king... He, oh, he could take him off his position as, 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 as prince, I guess you could say. Or, or maybe he won't have the blessings from, uh, from the, 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 the kingdom of Egypt anymore. But yet Moses looked to the greater goal, didn't he? He looked to where the, the direction in which God pointed him. Even though Moses, remember, he had a little fear too, didn't he? He kind of gave us some excuses. Remember those excuses? I, I, who am I to go speak? Well, here's your brother Aaron. You know, every excuse that Moses was, was giving God, God would come back and say, haven't I not done this? Have I not made the mute, the blind, and the dumb? Have I not made all things? I can help you, I will help you, and I will be there to help you, but this is what you need to do. Moses had to gain that courage even when he had to stand before the highest government of the land, the Pharaoh of Egypt. What about from just life issues? Fear and adversity that comes just from issues of life. You know, I'm starting to count this is just me, but I'm starting to count how many times I hear the word, name, whatever you want to call it, COVID-19. I'm starting to like not hearing that word as often. And, and I know just as the adversity that comes in one way, it, it comes in another way. We're having another struggle in the world now, aren't we? Romans 5 and verse 12 tells us this. When one man sinned, it wasn't sin that spread to all men. It was death that spread to all men. Why? Because all sin. Death comes to us in many ways. The issues of life happen, and just as COVID-19 took many lives, and I am not going to, to, uh, to, to dismiss it within the lesson because 
it was one of the things that Brother Crosswhite had given as the example of, of dealing with fear and adversity because that's what we've been dealing with, isn't it? But I want you to think about Romans chapter 8 for a moment. Romans chapter 8, when Paul himself, he speaks about the things he has been through as he preaches the Gospel and as he goes into the world and as he deals with many things, he says in verse 35, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? Now, look, those three things can happen because of men and because of the trials that come, of, of the issues that, that happen because you're preaching the Gospel, but yet famine. Does famine happen because you preach the Gospel? No, famine could just happen. It's an issue of life. Nakedness. Well, that could be because you obeyed the Gospel and because you were preaching the truth, but the peril that came to Him. Remember, what was He in the sea as the ship broke apart? Now, I know God is always with His people. And I know that God is helping Paul spread the Gospel. But verse 37, he says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Think about that. If the church would take that approach to any adversity that comes along. We are more than conquerors. Now I know we did our best. We did our best as the church, didn't we? To be able to handle the issues that were happening with gathering together. It was tough, wasn't it? Did anyone like not gathering together? I don't think there's any true that is faithful child of God who said, that was great going in and, and, and sitting in my living room and watching services or trying to participate. That's what, trying to participate together. We did our best saying we all know we're right there or we're trying. But I think there's some lessons we also learned, wasn't it? Isn't it, church? There's some lessons we learned. We can do better, but we also have to remember that the biggest lesson we need to learn is trust that God will be with us and help us. Yes, bad things will happen. Difficulties will come. We will suffer physically, but we've got to trust that God will be with us. God will help us. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, if this tent is destroyed, if this tent is destroyed, what are we taught? We are taught that we have a building from God. A house not made with hands. Eternal in the heavens. Fear and adversity come from life issues. But finally on this section, church, do you realize that fear and adversity also comes from issues in the church? This one's tough. Because it happens still today. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 10. Remember Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Oh, pardon me, that was Romans 12 and verse 1. I plead with you, brethren, that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then what happened in, in, in verse 11? He, he spoke to them about their divisions. There are some people who say, I was baptized by this person. Some people say, I was baptized by this person. Church, we can even fall into the same frame of denominationalism by lifting up one man above another man. And church, we can't do that. We've got to humble ourselves and realize that if we're lifting up men above other men, we are causing divisions. Now, you say, how does that happen? Because we need to give honor to whom honor is due. We know this. And we know there are people who are working and we're going to say, great job, that's a good job. Please keep up the good work. But don't do such in causing a division in the church in which some men are given more of a grander status than another. What could those things be? Church, it can be things like an education level. It can be church, it can be things like monetary status. We don't want to lose that member, because if that member goes, so does our contribution. So we need to placate to that member's desires. And that brings about 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And these four points, I'm going to go through these quickly here, are all from 1 Corinthians. And we know that the, the book of 1 Corinthians is dealing with a lot of problems in the church. What were they acting like? Carnal, worldly people in verse 3. For where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? As a child of God, we are more than just a mere man, aren't we? We are a child of God. Does that not resonate with us as a child of God? We are His people. We belong to Him. 
Why should we be striving with one another? We're trying to get to the place through His only begotten Son, a place where we will be all together. And I guarantee you, we're not going to be in the place for eternity if we're going to be striving here on this earth with one another and acting like mere men. I know that Jesus said, in my Father's house are many places, spaces. The church, I'm not going to have my space away from you because I can't get along with you in the church here on this earth. Does that make any sense? If we act like mere men and strive with one another and we think we're both going to go to heaven and yet we're constantly bickering and fighting with one another, and that all derives from 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, our wisdom, human wisdom, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And sometimes we fight over the pettiest things. I've heard of congregations splitting over when the Lord's Supper is, before the sermon or after the sermon. Have you heard that stuff? I don't know if it happens down here in Alabama, but I know it's happened up there in Missouri. I've heard of people, all kinds of problems, from the colors of the paint of the walls to the pews, whether we should have pews still or chairs, and division happens because of these simple, basic things. And yet, think about 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 2, the man who had his father's wife. What did Paul say they were? They weren't doing anything about it because they were, they were puffed up. And the adversity comes to the church over and over again even when there are those who could be fighting for the truth, have to fight against the, those who are not fighting for the truth. Yes, I know that there is a time we need to mark. I realize that. Romans 16, 17, and 18. I realize there's a time when we have to separate. I realize there's a time, but church, we're separating sometimes over the trivial things and not over the doctrinal issues. Fear and diversity comes from issues in the church, but yet we, in the last few minutes that I have, we can overcome the fear that exists in us naturally and the fear that happens because of adversity when we listen to God. Now, go back to Ezra. This time, chapter 6. Just quickly here, Ezra chapter 6. Remember, they stopped building. They stopped building. They stopped working. They stopped doing what God had wanted His people to do and that's serve Him. But yet God raised for them the prophets. Zechariah, Haggai. And it says in verse 14, the elders of the Jews built and they prophesied through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet, Zechariah the son of Ido, and they built and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Adaxerxes, king of Persia. You see, they finally listened to God. And they were able to finish the work. I love Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Because here, Isaiah is proclaiming what God says to us all, fear not, I'm with you. Fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I think about what God did to, Israel, or to Egypt with His mighty hand. But yet He'll hold us up with His righteous hand mighty hand. And we've got to be willing to be content as we read earlier in Hebrews 13. And we've got to cast all our care upon Him because He cares for us. But yet Philippians 4 and verse 6, I know it's easy to say. I know it's easy to read. I know it's sometimes hard to do. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But what are we supposed to use? Supplication and prayer. Let our thanksgiving and our request to be made known unto God so that we can be confident to know that whatever fear exists in our life, whatever adversity comes, if God is for us, who, and may I add, what can possibly get be against us? Jesus gives us these words in John 14, 27. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I want to leave you with a verse, the first part of this second verse, I believe, of a song that many of us know. But as we talk about overcoming fear and adversity, even if it's the fear that, that we put on ourselves personally or the adversity that comes from external sources, I want you to think about the words of this song. 
was great grace that taught my heart to fear, trust in God, fear and reverence Him, and grace my fears relieved. Thank you all.